Hello, my name is Tom, and in this talk I will present our lightweight IoT abstractions for embedded WebAssembly. Programming microcontrollers is hard, and is typically done in low-level languages such as C. But development in these languages is error-prone, especially memory bugs are very hard to track down, which makes development very time-intensive. Additionally, on microcontrollers there is often no debugging available, which makes finding bugs even harder. And lastly, every time we make a change to the program, however small, we need to recompile everything and re-upload the entire codebase to the embedded device. And that is a very slow process. If we were to program microcontrollers in a high-level language, many of these problems would disappear. We would have memory safety, which means less bugs, and it is also easier to support more advanced features that help speed up development, such as debugging and live code updates. But which high-level language to choose? If we want to support all of them, we would have to port each language to every electronic platform out there. This is clearly not feasible. We would much rather use virtualization and decouple the languages and the electronic platforms. WebAssembly bytecode forms the perfect compile target for this task. And that is why the Arduino virtual machine was developed by my colleague Robert Gurdjieff Sinch at Ghent University. It allows us to execute standard WebAssembly code on embedded systems. But there are still two problems we need to solve before we can start using high-level languages to program embedded devices. Standard WebAssembly does not support interrupts. And there is also a mismatch between the high-level data structures of the targeted programming language and the low-level numeric types of WebAssembly. This gap will need to be bridged with specific language symbiosis. We will discuss each of our solutions for these problems in turn, starting with supporting interrupts. The Arduino virtual machine allows us to take any standard WebAssembly program, upload it to an embedded system and execute it. However, we want to interact with the environment by, for instance, reading sensor values or communicating over the internet with protocols such as MQTT. To keep programs lightweight and efficient, these things are normally done with the help of interrupts, which standard WebAssembly does not support. Let's make this less abstract by looking at a concrete example. This Rust code uses an interrupt to toggle an LED on or off when a button is pressed. Both the button and LED are connected to the embedded system through pins. To toggle the LED on or off, the toggle function only needs to read the current value of the LED pin, whether it is high or low, and then write the opposite value back to the same pin. It does this with the digital read and digital write functions that are imported from a Arduino package, just like all the other functions used in this example. But many digital pins on embedded devices support both input and output. That is why we need to first set the correct mode for each of the pins involved before we can read and write to them. This is done in the enable LED function. After the correct modes are set, we can register our toggle function to be called whenever the value of the button pin changes. In order for this example to work on embedded systems, we have extended the Arduino virtual machine with a lightweight system for handling interrupts, which is modeled after the publish subscribe paradigm. We add an interrupt handler entity to the VM, which will keep a list of topics mapped to callback functions. Our small demo with the button and LED would work as follows. A WebAssembly program, which is loaded into the virtual machine, can specify a function which needs to be called when a specific interrupt happens, like the toggle function in the previous example. That function can be referenced by a unique index from the WebAssembly global store. This index acts as an address for the function and we can use it to register the function for a specific topic with the interrupt handler. This means the interrupt handler simply has a list of topics mapped to function indices. When the embedded system receives an interrupt after the button is pressed, it is up to the interrupt handler to find the corresponding topic for this interrupt and call the registered function. However, it will not do this immediately. When the embedded device receives an interrupt, the interrupt handler will simply create a new event with the correct topic and with all the arguments for the function that needs to be called. It then adds this event to a first-in, first-out queue. 
it is the virtual machine's responsibility to determine when to execute callback functions. In our current implementation, it will do this every time an instruction is finished executing, except when a callback function is being executed, as we do not allow those to be interrupted by other callback functions. So before executing a new instruction, the virtual machine will let the interrupt handler check if there are still unprocessed events in the queue. If so, the handler will pop an event from the queue and add the arguments for the callback function on top of the stack, as well as add a frame for the corresponding callback function to the call stack. When this is done, execution can resume as usual. The virtual machine needn't even know whether an event was popped from the queue. It will simply execute what is on the stack, which means that after the callback function, the program will resume where it left off. Our paper contains the complete formal description of the system. This means we have now solved the first problem, which is to support the interrupts. With this, we can now add WebAssembly modules to the Arduino virtual machine that expose specific IoT functionality, whether it is to connect to a Wi-Fi network or use MQTT to communicate over the internet. These modules can now use interrupts to implement that functionality efficiently. For instance, the Wi-Fi module may include a primitive to retrieve the local IP address of the embedded device. In WebAssembly, this function will look as follows. We should note that it does not return a string, like it would in a high-level language, but instead the type clearly shows us that it has two parameters, both 32-bit integers. This is because WebAssembly only contains basic numeric types. This means our only option is to save strings to the WebAssembly linear memory which is just a long array of bytes, and refer to the string with indices in that array. We chose to describe strings with both their start and end index in memory. However, there is a second caveat. We cannot simply return these two integers because WebAssembly only supports one memory. This limitation means the string must be saved in the memory specified by the program over which the Arduino virtual machine has no full control and subsequently cannot feasibly know where there will be free space to save the string. That is why the virtual machine expects the WebAssembly program to provide an area of free memory as an argument to the primitive. This brings us neatly to the second problem, that of language symbiosis. While we can compile programs written in high-level languages to WebAssembly and execute this code in the Arduino virtual machine, things get more complicated when we introduce Arduino-specific WebAssembly modules that implement specific IoT functionality. It is impossible for the compiler to know how primitives from these modules handle things such as strings. So for each of our modules and for each high-level language we want to support, we need to bridge the gap between the high-level abstractions from the programming languages and the low-level types of WebAssembly. This comes down to writing pieces of glue code in both the virtual machine as in the language we want to provide. We have done this for both Rust and AssemblyScript, a variant on TypeScript developed specifically to compile to WebAssembly. We'll focus on Rust for the rest of our talk, as the glue code for TypeScript is entirely analogous. Now, let's take a look at the local IP primitive from before, as an example. When we want to get the local IP in a Rust program, we expect to do this with a function that simply returns the string, or even a specific local IP enum. Instead, here we have to pass two arguments, a buffer and a size, and the function returns nothing. There is clearly a mismatch between the different abstraction levels, those of Rust and WebAssembly. With a small piece of glue code, we can fix this. In Rust, we write a function that will wrap around the imported primitive, but now with the expected interface. No arguments, and it returns a string. The function only does three things. First, it allocates a buffer to receive the IP address in. Second, it passes the buffer to the primitive. In the third and final step, the function decodes the content of the buffer to a string that it returns as the result. All we need to do in the virtual machine is ensure that the string, when written to WebAssembly memory, is UTF-8 encoded, and this glue code will work. 
Then we can write a simple program, such as this, where we call the local IP function from before and get a string back as expected, which we can then print to the serial port with another Arduino primitive. After adding this glue code, we have solved the last piece of the puzzle. With both interrupts and language symbiosis, we can write real IoT applications on embedded devices with Arduino. We've also evaluated the response time of our interrupt system by implementing the small demo we've used throughout this talk. And we've measured the time it takes for the LED to turn on or off after the button signal is sent. In Arduino, this takes an average of 336 microseconds, compared to 20 microseconds in C code. While this is quite a difference, Arduino is still fast enough to write responsive programs where users cannot perceive a delay. In an earlier project, we also ran micro benchmarks to compare Arduino against native code, which showed that Arduino is on average 465 times slower than native code. However, compared to Esprino, a popular JavaScript interpreter for embedded devices, Arduino executes the same benchmarks 10 times faster, on average. We plan on optimizing Arduino further, but the current performance already allows us to write simple IoT applications like the following demo. We have implemented the button example we use throughout this talk in Rust, but with a twist. Not only can you push a button to turn on the LED, the program now also listens to an MQTT server for messages to turn the LED on or off. In addition, it also sends messages to the server whenever it changes the status of the LED. In other words, the demo now implements a very simple smart lamp setup. Here you can see this in action. We press the button and the LED turns on. But now we can also turn the LED on from a distance, with our phone for instance. So when we press the button on the screen, our phone sends an MQTT message over Wi-Fi to a local MQTT server. That passes it on to the embedded device. When that message arrives, the LED is turned on or off, depending on the message. As you can see, the delay is only very slight. In conclusion, we have added a lightweight interrupt handling framework to Arduino that is fully formally described. And we have added language symbiosis for two high-level languages. The benchmarks and demo show that with these three additions to the virtual machine, we can now write real-world IoT applications on embedded devices. As a final note, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. And if you want to check out the project yourself, our code is available on GitHub. <laughs>